Spread across the landscape in southern Idaho are echoes of a fiery past waiting for its encore. This is Craters of the Moon National Monument. The land is otherworldly, hardened by black lava flow that extends for miles and is punctuated by massive craters that mark the sites of past eruptions. Walking on these rocks, you hear the delicate rustling of the porous cinders before your feet. These rocks are at least 2,000 years old, and new ones may be on the way before we know it. The volcanic landscape here is powerful, enthralling, fascinating, and we believe that it's due for its next eruption. But whether we're talking about its past, its present, or its future, Craters of the Moon is a place with an exciting story very worth telling. The story of Craters of the Moon began about 15,000 years ago when the first eruption began. Over the next 13,000 years, there would be eight periods of eruptions, some lasting a few hundred years and others lasting a couple thousand. Now interestingly, each period of volcanic activity spilled about the same amount of lava. Regardless of whether it was over hundreds or thousands of years, the eruptions yielded a grand total of about 1 to 1.5 cubic miles of lava. For size reference, if you watched my Great Sand Dunes video, you might remember that there is a total of about 1.5 cubic miles of sand in the entire park. So every eruption at Craters of the Moon basically created another Great Sand Dunes. Except, you know, with lava instead. In total, that amounts to about eight times the volume of one Great Sand Dunes. That's a lot. Going back to as early as about 12,000 years ago, archaeological evidence suggests that there were groups of indigenous people that might have settled there back then. This means that it's very likely that they witnessed some of these fantastic eruptions, and it's also very likely that they had a lot of trouble making brochures for the area because a massive volcanic wasteland doesn't exactly sell itself as best place to live. Now, unlike the Yellowstone caldera, which is not predicted to erupt any time in the next several thousand years, Craters of the Moon is almost definitely going to erupt again, and it could be as soon as in the next 1,000 years. Eruptive periods, on average, occurred every 2,000 years in the past, and it has been over 2,000 years since the last eruption. We even have a pretty good idea of what the next eruption will be like. We're thinking that the biggest hazard will be the slow-moving lava flow that, while it doesn't go very fast, can travel up to 20 miles from the eruption site. There will also probably be lava fountaining high up, but the good news is this won't reach a very wide radius. The nearest populated areas will probably not be very affected by the eruptions. And while the surrounding area of Craters of the Moon does have a few farms, the plan is to get everybody out at the first sign of any volcanic activity. Now, in reading about this, I found something that was pretty interesting and slightly concerning because apparently somebody decided in 1949 that it would be a great idea to put a lab with all these nuclear reactors and radioactive waste within the eruption radius of the volcanoes. <clears throat> and I quote, the Idaho National Laboratory lies on the eastern margin of the Great Rift, and its nuclear reactors and radioactive waste storage facility may be impacted by future lava flow eruptions. Are you kidding? Ah yes, let's find a nice space to put the new laboratory with all of our nuclear reactors and hazardous waste and whatnot. And what's this? Perfect. Now, the good news is that these are considered very low threat volcanoes, which I don't really know what that means because you're talking about a volcano and volcanoes tend to be pretty destructive, but at least compared to other volcanoes, this one shouldn't be too bad. And all jokes aside, we are constantly monitoring the area for any unusual volcanic activity to make sure that we can get everybody out safe and sound. Yes, uh, what is this great rift that you speak of? What a great question. Let's look into how this place came to be. This volcanic activity all occurred along a 65 mile long deep set of cracks in the earth called the Great Rift Volcanic Zone. It is only one of two features like this in the entire world and it's responsible for a vast majority of the volcanic activity in the northwestern part of the country. There are actually several volcanoes in Idaho, but Craters of the Moon is of special interest because we think it's going to be the one that erupts next. Still, because the volcanic activity comes from the same place, we're able to learn a ton about its properties, like the fact that over a cubic mile per eruption period spills out. But what else? There's a lot of really cool stuff to look into, and this was my favorite part while researching for this video. The type of formations you see at Craters of the Moon are all made of basaltic rock. 
Is that how you say that? Basalt. I'm gonna look that up. Basalt. Basalt. It, 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 it is basalt. 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 I don't know why that feels weird to say. Basalt? Basalt is the type of rock that most of the Earth's crust is made of, although a lot of it is also in the mantle. It's the melting of the basalt. Basalt. It's the melting of the basalt in the mantle that produces the basaltic magma that erupts from these volcanoes. Basalt is also unique in that it has a lower concentration of a chemical compound called silica. This is important because silica is responsible for making a lot of things a little bit more viscous and slow moving. So if basalt has less silica, then it's gonna be a lot more liquid-like and a lot more free flowing. This is exactly why we're predicting that the lava is gonna be able to flow over 20 miles from the original eruption site. Basalt erupts at temperatures between 1100 and 1250 degrees Celsius, which is the same as 2012 to 2282 degrees Fahrenheit. Seriously, like I can't even conceptualize how hot that is. Basaltic lava is also super cool because it can harden in a huge variety of formations. So here are some of the ones that I thought were the most awesome. And this is not an exhaustive list, there are a lot more formations in this, but these are some of the ones that I thought were the absolute coolest and are definitely ones that I wouldn't have wanted to miss. There are two main types of lava flow that are incredibly different from one another. And okay, I don't want to offend anybody by totally butchering the pronunciation of these. So here are the names of the lava flow and I'll let you sit there and sound it out. Now, these flow types have a ton of differences from one another that gets pretty technical. So for this video, I'm going to focus on the biggest difference between the two. This type of flow has a very rough surface while the other type is much smoother and has more of a ropey appearance. Craters of the Moon has almost entirely Pahoehoe flow. Okay, that wasn't too bad. <clears throat> Craters of the Moon has almost entirely Pahoehoe flow. These take the form of many lava rivers that are able to travel long distances. There are some examples of the other type of flow as well, but they are very few and far between. The next formation we'll be talking about are cinder cones. Cinder cones are a type of volcano, and they're also the most common type of volcano in the world. At the center of the cone is the eruption site, or technically speaking, the vent, where the magma escapes from. The volcano explodes and sends this magma flying out of the vent high into the air. But what goes up must come down, and a lot of this material lands right back close to the vent that it came from. Over the course of the eruption, this rock and ash collect more and more until they form that classic volcano cone shape that we're all familiar with. Craters of the Moon has a huge cinder cone you can walk up. It's a short but pretty steep hike, but the view at the top is awesome. Moving on to the next formation, spatter cones are very similar to cinder cones, but with one key difference. As the eruption in a cinder cone volcano begins to calm and become less explosive, the cinders aren't launched as high into the air. This doesn't give them time to cool and harden as much as when they were launched really, really high. So when they land, they're more blob-like and runny. Basically, these hot lumps of lava run together into this characteristic spatter shape. These can form cone shapes too, although they do look a little funkier than the classic cinder cone. Next up are lava tubes. So this is pretty sick. <laughs> Craters of the Moon has caves formed by lava, and most of the caves you and I are familiar with are formed by water coming into rocks, but these are formed in a totally different way. As lava flows out from an eruption, lava on the outer parts of the flow cool and harden while the lava on the inside remains molten and continues to flow. Eventually, the outer portion begins to insulate the inside, keeping it hot enough for the molten lava to continue to flow in its semi-liquid form. This creates a cave or tube-like shape that creates a pretty cool structure. These can either be left hardened in a cave shape like in Craters of the Moon, or they can remain active like in Hawaii. Hawaii has some active lava tubes that are literally underground lava rivers. The last formation that I thought was pretty awesome is an area of hardened flow called Blue Dragon Flow. It's named this way because the rock looks like the scales of a blue dragon. The blue color comes from small amounts of titanium in the rock. Interestingly too, it's only outside the rock that has the titanium in the bluish color. If you cut into it, it just looks like that classic reddish color that comes from oxidizing iron. And that is it. That is the story of Craters of the Moon. I really enjoyed this one. I thought it was very interesting. I hope you did too. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. This is episode three in my National Park series, where I dive into the science behind the beauty of our national parks and hopefully have a little bit of fun along the way. My channel is all about how nature is good for our mental and physical health, and I also try to learn things about it in the process. So if that sounds good to you, go ahead and hit subscribe, join the community, and I will see you real soon.